The topic reads as follows. Me, my pension and I, with legislation on the pan-European personal pension product, PEP, laying the foundation for easier cross-border retirement savings, what should the EU do to increase financial literacy among young people to ensure they benefit from such initiatives and are better equipped to save and invest for retirement with a long-term perspective and in a sustainable way? And before we go to the proposition speech by the committee, we actually also have a video very kindly submitted to us by MEP Sophie Indveld, who is a member of the Econ Committee and actually worked on the PEP file as well. So we'll now watch the video first. Thank you. Dear European Youth Parliament, I'm very sorry I cannot be with you myself, but I'm happy to have the opportunity to address a few words to you by way of this video message. You'll be talking about financial education, financial literacy, and in particular with a view to retirement provisions or pensions. Uh, and it's something when you're young, and I remember this, you know, you don't really think so much about the future and you'll think like, oh, well, you know, when I'm in my mid-60s, I'll arrange something. But of course, if you want to save for retirement, you have to start early. And I remember I did that when I was about 25 because I realized that when I was younger, it was still quite normal for people to have to work for the same employer for 40 years or 45 years, and they would save up uh, pensions. But already my generation had a very different career pattern. We wouldn't always work for the same employer. We might change jobs or maybe work as an independent for a couple of years or a freelancer or go abroad. Uh, and so we were much more reliant on uh, our own provisions. And also because of um, population aging, we can see that the burden on young generations uh, is growing because we all need to provide for each other and there are just more and more old people that we have to provide for. So when I was 25, I thought maybe, you know, I should start saving, putting some money aside and I took out a life insurance um, and so many years later, looking back, I realized that I didn't get proper advice and I wasn't financially literate, and I bought a product that was actually no good, and I, you know, my savings were not worth a whole lot. Um, and actually, that's, that's a waste. And I, I wish that at the time, somebody would have explained to me, somebody would have given me advice, um, you know, what would have been suitable for my particular situation, and how to make sure that I bought the right product um, and I relied at the time on the advice of somebody who was actually not independent on a commercial agent of a company. So I think it is very, very important that we get not just financial education, for example, in school, but also that we learn to get independent advice and independent um, expertise. There are independent experts who offer their services, but you can, of course, also uh, ask a consumer organization, they will also be offered to offer independent advice. And it is very important because, you know, when you're in your mid-twenties, you really cannot predict where you're going to be 40 or 50 years later. Um, and we can see that all over Europe, pension systems are under pressure. Pension systems that were designed for previous generations, for a world and a labor market that no longer exists. And there's more and more um, let's say, is required from us to make our own private arrangements. And that's why in the European Parliament and with the member state governments, we have elaborated uh, a rule, a regulatory framework for a new product, we call it PEP, the uh, Pan-European Personal Pension Product, which is a kind of um, uh, individual complementary product that people can buy and, and make their own individual savings, of course, in addition to the state pensions or the occupational pension uh, schemes that they might have. But in any case, it's very important that you inform yourself, that you get independent advice, uh, and not just on pensions, of course, but your whole financial planning that also goes for mortgages or maybe taking out uh, a loan for something, taking out, uh, getting credit for your, for your business. Um, it's important to make a long-term planning for your life and also calculate in unforeseen life events. You don't know what will happen. Maybe you will move abroad or you will get children or 
um, uh, you will lose your job or maybe there will be a period of sickness or invalidity or maybe you want a career change at the age of 45 you don't know so you have to you know to realize that your your life may take turns that you don't expect and you don't foresee so for all this you know sit down take your time get all the information that you need from independent experts and get an advice that suits your situation. So I think it is very, very good that you are uh, addressing this topic today because we have seen in the past that people uh, who did not get um, adequate advice, who were not financially literate uh, in the financial crisis, they have lost everything, all their savings, their pensions, uh, and it led to a lot of misery. So I think it is very important and very good that you're addressing this not very sexy, but very, very important topic. So I wish you a very good conference, uh, and I hope that you will manage to really put this topic on the political agenda of the European Youth Parliament and also the European Parliament. So have a very good conference. Amazing. It's always really valuable to hear from the MEPs who are actually working on these files themselves and about their personal experiences as well. So even though she's not in the room, great thanks to Ms. Infield for taking time to um, provide us with, with that video. So we'll now go to the proposition speech by the proposing committee, Econ 1. Are you ready? Great. Excellent. You are recognized. Julia. <laughs> Honorable members of the board, fellow delegates, and distinguished guests. Um, the lack of financial literacy among young people is an issue that neither is adequately addressed in the EU nor in member states. And as we've already heard, Europe is facing a demographic transition. So there will be more people claiming out their state-organized and occupational pensions, while there will be less people paying money into them due to low birth rates and higher life expectancies. In addition, the European workforce is mo more mobile and the management of public finances is not adequately efficient. And these factors are putting pressure on current structures, among them the pension system, meaning that investment decisions from now on to a greater extent will rest with each individual person. And therefore, the need for financial literacy is increasing. In several member states, the level of financial education is insufficient, leading to an extensive gap between uh, regarding financial literacy among member states. And this is the main underlying concern that we, as a committee, have addressed in our resolution. And therefore, we have found solutions on how particularly young people can make use of financial tools and initiatives, such as the recently adopted pan-European personal pension product. However, as the majority of European politics, this is a problem that cannot be solved by the European Union alone. The Parliament cannot force member states to implement uh, educational legislation due to the EU's supporting power. And therefore, our resolution is divided into two tool sections, one on a European level and one on a member state level as well as a cohesion section in order to tackle the lack of cooperation between member states. In addition, we've also suggested areas of improvement regarding the current framework, not only to tackle the lack of financial literacy among young people, but also to meet the st strong interest among young people regarding uh, sustainability issues that the world is facing. And on that note, we're looking to forward to hearing your thoughts about our resolution, and we hope you find our solutions as uh, favorable as we do. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Amanda, for that really well-structured and clear speech. Um, 
And then now I'd like to open the floor for our two position speeches, if we have committees who would be interested. Okay, so the two sp position speeches that we're gonna take will come from NV1 and Econ3. So you're recognized, in it. and again, if both speakers could come to the podium. And can I just remind as well, if you could keep your speeches to two minutes, that would be great, thank you. Dear President, Vice President, Honourable Members of the Board, Distinguished Guests and Fellow Delegates, on behalf of the Econ3 Committee, which also focused on educating the public on the financial system, we are concerned that your resolution is not targeting the problem in an effective way. We would first of all like to point out that you're overemphasizing media campaigns. We find that the younger generation is already experiencing an overload of online information and media consumption. Bearing that in mind and considering that the majority of your target group is mostly li most likely not interested in the financial system, we cannot fully support your focus on this. Instead, we believe that you should have focused more on approaching the green impact that individuals have on their investment pathway when paying into pension funds. It was even mentioned in your motion for a resolution and we believe you haven't stressed this enough. Moreover, we also fear that you fell short on putting measures in place targeting the working class, especially their inability to put savings in the third pillar consistently, making them particularly vulnerable to decreased dependency on the first and the second pillar, as proposed in the ninth operating clause. Finally, we believe the European Commission itself has no competence to provide young people with low-cost low financial advice as, provised, as proposed in your OC number four as the European Commission is not the appropriate body for implementing low-scale grassroots projects like this, we would recommend you to amend this OC and find another body to take the responsibility for this proposal. This being said, we are looking forward to a fruitful discussion. I want to point out that we, as the Econ3 committee, recognize the importance of your, of your topic and do appreciate your efforts made in the resolution. Thank you. Um, dear Miss President, members of the board, fellow delegates and honorable guests, pension systems all around Europe are falling apart. Less and less working people have to pay for the pensions of more and more pensioners. The pension age is rising. Lower pensions are looming. The Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs one has come up with some great solutions for the problem of the third problems of the third pillar and the financial literacy however the real problems are with the first pillar the first pillar is extremely vulnerable because working people the current working people have to pay for the current pensioners that means it can be seriously endangered by the aging of the population that we see at this very moment. At the same time, it is the only way of making sure people don't starve after their retirement. It's the very foundation of our pension system, and it's crumbling. Let us restore it. Instead of building a skyscraper on soft ground, and waste our resources. So let us make sure people get their safe retirement. Let us make sure that people, that we make people pay a progressive tax, which, uh, which will, of which the revenue will be gradually paid back as pensions, equally divided between all social economic groups once they've reached their 
their uh, pensionable age. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Emma and Samuel, for those speeches. Um, we'll now go back to the proposing committee for a response to the speeches from the floor, again for uh, one and a half minutes. Econ One, you're recognized. Um, thank you for your recognition, and uh, thank you for position speeches. So, uh, I would like to stress a few things. First of all, this resolution is not supposed to deal with economic and financial literacy in general. The main goal of our proposal is to ensure that young people can benefit from financial services and are able to save and invest for retirement. The reality is that there is an increasing number of various investments, assets, financial products and services. However, there is clearly a lack of adequate and unbiased information, which makes it almost impossible for young people to evaluate the consequences and risks of investing or not investing their savings. It's not possible to enforce strong consumer protecting policies in the financial markets, since it can be considered an unacceptable intervention into free market economy and create unfair or unequal conditions for the investors. But it is possible to create a reliable sources of objective information and tell the European youth that there is something to think about. The future, which might seem far, but is inevitable. That's what the Econ One resolution is about. And as for IC4, so we believe that it's almost impossible to provide free, high-quality financial advice. However, it is possible to reduce the cost of such advice significantly and the European Commission is definitely able to do that, and I can say more. In local offices of European Commission's, a Commission, for example, in Lithuania, they are already providing advices on various topics, including financial literacy and education. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sergei. I'd now like to open the first round of debate to other committees. We'll take the first point from Empel. You're recognized. Um, in OC9, you urge the member states to harmonize tax incentives. You should also keep in mind that this is not a shared competence, so the EU cannot intervene in every member state's tax incentives. Thank you. We'll next go to ETRA 1, after which we'll go to NB1. So ETRA 1, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, so I, so first of all, want to congratulate you on a well-written resolution. I, I think it, it looks good, it's well-written, but I do have <clears throat> some problems. Uh, I see that you're suggesting, for example, the use of video games as a way to make youth interested in, uh, in finance. But I, well, the, the problem I have with that is that it's only the youth that are already financially inter interested that want to play it. I'm more wondering why, instead of focusing so much on youth, on stuff that youth, youth themselves have to go out and find and actually try to play, that you don't go to schools, create programs for schools to use, try to find solutions that you can use, that, that can be implemented into schools by member states so that, they, so that youth get it through their actual normal standard education. I feel like a solution like that would be way better and way more effective at creating fin a financially li literate base of youth. Thank you. Thank you, Alf. Oh, I see we have a direct response from Draw One, so we'll go to Draw One first. I uh, completely agree with the previous point that was made because the uh, video game and media demographic is, al although it is mostly, well, made for the youth and young adults, 
uh, you have to make the game or a media creative enough, and I don't think that people who aren't really interested in the topic are gonna buy and pay money to play these games and then educate themselves. So yes, I completely agree, thank you very much. Thank you, now as promised, oh, I see another direct response from Econ2, so we'll go there first. Um, concerning the last two direct responses, between OC 13 to 15, they cover perfectly a good educational unit in order to write this. It's not just video games they're focusing on. Through 13 to 15, they have clearly mapped out how they're going to conduct financial literacy tests among young people according to their education level, age, and group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see so many direct responses already. Um, now, as promised, we'll go to NB1. Regard Regarding OC number five, if I'm not mistaken, an advertisement is to promote a product or a service. And having said this, how exactly will the European Commission inform young citizens on how to best use the financial advice? Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Now we'll go to E-Tray 2, after which we'll take a point from NV2. So E-Tray 2 first, you're recognized. Thank you for recognizing. Um, I was wondering if you have thought about OC number seven being kind of redundant because you have all these amazing uh, workshops and seminars as you have mentioned in other OCs on EU level and I believe that having European Literacy Day will be quite similar um, to the other OCs and we, it will be done with the same, uh, done, done the same way too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now as promised, NB2. <clears throat> Thank you for your recognition. Um, regarding OC number one, while the clause itself proposes a viable solution, the desired outcome is a bit utopic. As far as the OC is concerned, they are proposing websites, campaigns, and other strategies. Um, <clears throat> while, again, the OC is viable, um, you should be reminded that the EU is still facing some harsh regions of underdevelopment, namely Eastern Europe, where such matters as websites and campaigns would not be efficient. So, per consequently, the entire OC has a minor flaw that could affect the future of the effectiveness of the solution. Thank you, Rosvan. Looks like we have a direct response from Econ1, so we'll go straight to you. Quite on the contrary, due to the fact that uh, online resources are mostly and actually always free, they are always easily accessible, even for, even from the, uh, for those that uh, belong to uh, socially, economically, uh, let's say, underdeveloped groups. Thank you. Yes, NV2, I will let you have a direct response to that, so go ahead. The main problem is... <clears throat> The regions themselves, while being underdeveloped, do present high levels of general illiteracy. And so I would like we would like to suggest firstly focusing on the idea of general illiteracy and then advocating for economic illiteracy, namely for the youth. Thank you very much. Now we'll take one final point in this round, and then we'll go back to the proposing committee. And that final point will come from Libe. Thank you for recognizing me. <clears throat> I have a few questions concerning OC14B, where you're talking about the financial literacy courses. Um, I was wondering when you want these courses to take place and if you want these to be optional or mandatory, because I think that if they would be optional, most students would not participate in them. And if you would make them mandatory, it would just cut the students' free time and time for hobbies. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Now we'll go back to Econ 1 to respond to some of those points. Econ 1, are you ready? Great, you're recognized. Thank you for the points made. Uh, first of all, regarding OC number nine, you said that harmonization is not possible, but we just want member states to encourage this harmonization. And as the goal is to implement one pan-European pension product that is the same in every member state. And for every member state, we want to encourage the um, different member states. And then you talk about the video games. We thought this was a good strategy to youth. 
uh, like to young, uh, young ages, like from 15 to 18 years old. And we want some strategies to make financial literacy more attractive because we understand that sometimes it can be a subject that everyone is interested in. And then we also talk about other types of campaign. As we, talk, we also talk about tests in schools, workshops, webinars, seminars, and different types of strategies. Uh, I'll have to say thank you, Econ2, on the direct response you gave um, supporting us, our resolution about the schools and education. Uh, we also talk about online advertisement because we think it's a focus for the youth where young people uh, spend a lot of time and really can get to know in an attractive way about financial literacy. Uh, about the Special Literacy Day in Europe, we think it's a way to make or uh, to improve our resolution. And the last point you made was on OC14B, uh, where you talk about if the courses and the tests in schools are going to be mandatory or optional, as it's, it's not a uh, um, it is a supporting comp uh, competence education. We can't make member states make mandatory courses, but we can encourage them to make them optional, and that is what we defend. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thanks everyone for a very active first round. And we'll now move on to the second round of open debate, and we'll start with Drup 2. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, in OC8, the committee calls upon the national central banks in the EU to create unbiased public information or material. I find this rather vague OC a bit unnecessary because isn't this just the news? Thank you. We'll now take the next two points from NV1 and EMPL. So we'll go to NV1 first. Oh, apologies, there is a direct response from EMPL, so we will take that first. Okay, so on OC8, we agree and we'd like to add that despite saying unbiased in the actual test, post-2008, anything attached to a bank faces distrust. Now I would recommend that you have an intermediate party in between the bank and the people to basically, on a more community basis, give them more trustworthy and personalised information. Thank you very much. Now we're going to end one as promised. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, I also have a question regarding OC14. So if I understood you correctly, you want to make it optional. And then not only is it not different from any other mentioned campaigns, which already have a lot of. Furthermore, I believe that the youth is a lot more likely to participate in, in campaigns and projects than tests and clauses, since that is not really popular with the youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll take a point from eTray1. Thank you, regarding OC number six. Don't you think that promoting a site is not effective as you won't be actually motivating the youth? What uh, is the use of a site that nobody actually accesses? Even if you get information there, how do you motivate the youth to actually enter and read and watch videos on that site? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next two points from IMCO and then go to INTA. So IMCO, you are here now. Uh, I have a question concerning the problem that you mentioned in your first IC, first IC about first and second pillars of the pension because I'm not sure if you're tackling the problem of secure income after retirement for all citizens that you mentioned in your ICs. Thank you. Thank you. As promised, INTA, you are up next. Uh, I have a point concerning ICK because I unfortunately don't see the issue of language barriers between the member states hindering the dissemination of national financial literacy initiatives covered because um, although you mention languages in OC number six, a new digital pla platform, uh, platform available in all official EU languages doesn't provide a solution on how one should um, deal with language barriers between the member states. Thank you very much, Sophia. We'll now go to ETRA 3. Thank you for recognizing us. First of all, we'd like to congratulate you on your great resolutions. We do have a point on OC5. You talk about online advertisements. 
Um, when you talk about online advertisements, there are algorithms that regulate which advertisements are shown to you based on your search history. If you never search for anything related to finances, you won't get any advertisements regarding finances. Won't this create an even bigger gap in society, worsening the situation you, meant, you mentioned in ICE? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now take the final point in this round from Afet. And then, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, and then we will go indeed back to Econ One for their response. So Afet, you are recognized. Hello, I am Iris from Albanian delegation. Uh, regarding ICF and the extent of OC2, 4, and 5, the OCs you are suggesting are a waste of resources and time because uh, the research that I made let me list a few of the promoters. Spark us and finance a group to promote local and regional development of finance, the competition and consumer and um, consumer protection and its mission to bring financial education in all segments of all population. GA Europe that works in financial capability, work readiness and entrepreneurial success. Also, I can name you 18 organizations that offer various financial education programs throughout Europe in an international, national and regional level. So I guess there's no lack of information. Thank you. Thank you. Econ One, are you ready to respond to that second round of debate? Yes, excellent, you're recognized. Regarding OC number, uh, OC number eight, uh, it is true that uh, the focus for our topic is on the youth. However, the whole population will be affected, which is why we believe that, this, um, that we need to address uh, and to target the whole population uh, as well as the youth. Uh, regarding the digital platform that was discussed, uh, we believe that it would be uh, more easily accessible um, be, due to the nature of technology as, a, as one of the, um, the most present things in our daily lives than it would be um, for youngsters to access um, the information through handbooks or paper or uh, any other materials provided in schools. This is why we chose to, um, to insist on um, using a digital platform. In addition to that, um, to, to discuss um, the point that stated that uh, we do not have any uh, solutions targeting a secure income, um, we have the two pillars, that uh, the, the first pillar for pensions and the second one, and in addition to that, there is the third pillar for pensions, which provides um, the, um, a voluntary um, contribution. Uh, to pensions, and that is the PEP that was uh, recently launched. We have um, OCs that target PEP, and as well as uh, the financial literacy. Uh, now, regarding lang the language barriers and why it, it would be necessary for us to uh, to provide uh, the youth with um, information in all uh, official languages of the European Union. Uh, financial literacy was proven to be, uh, low financial literacy was proven to be mostly linked to, um, to the socioeconomic groups that um, are the most vulnerable, uh, which is why we believe that uh, for them it is most likely that they do not know any other language other than their own. This is why it is especially important to uh, have that information uh, accessible in their own language. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now start off the third round, and the first three committees we'll go to are Econ 3, Empel, and Dura, respectively. So Econ 3, you're recognized. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Uh, I would like to talk about OC 15. Uh, considering that you want to introduce a mandatory scoring for third pillar products, how do you intend to prevent third pillar products to intentionally appear more sustainable than they actually might be? And with this, using the scoring platform for personal gain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And uh, now let's go to Empel. Thank you. My name is Luke Piercy, and regarding OC number one, we at Empel believe that websites and campaigns aren't enough for tackling such a big problem that is financial literacy. And instead, we should focus on creating a solution that is better directed at the financially literate, such as creating or supporting an already existing NGO that focuses on financial literacy courses so they can gain the necessary skills to enter the labor market and therefore have the proper information to be able to plan their future pensions. 
Thank you very much. And now, finally, draw one. Thank you for recognizing me. Regarding OC7, uh, could you please elaborate on how this table work and why this is even important to implement and make a whole day around it? Thank you. Thank you. Now let's go next to INTA, and after that we're going to be taking a point from each ray three. So INTA, you're recognized. Thank you, the board, for the recognition, and thank you for Econ for sh er, uh, shining a light on a rather pressing issue present. However, I'd like to direct your attention to clauses one, two, five, and six, all of which state which the essentially identical points. Furthermore, as aforementioned, the clauses are focused on campaigning rather than tackling the economical and financial issues ever present. Although valid points have been made, as Ms. Indevolt previously mentioned, the pensioner system is greatly outdated, and in one's opinion, the focus should be on fixing how the EU manages its finances and not its campaigning. Thank you. Thank you, Rosita. Now, e 3, and after that, we are <coughs> going to go to NB1. So, e 3, you're recognized. Thank you for recognizing me. Regarding to your points, in the educational se section of OCs, you're encouraged to increase the use of awareness about knowledges in economics, taxes, and finance. So, in your opinion, which age do you find the most suitable for such trainings? High schooler, schooler, or others? Thank you. Thank you. NB1, go ahead. Yep, thank you for recognizing you. me. I had a point regarding uh, OC11 and the OC14 subclause A, as uh, they have a clear overlap between them, and 14A would uh, probably be unnecessary in my opinion, as testing is not necessarily required for education on uh, financial literacy. Thank you. Thank you, Christophers. Now let's go to draw two. Thank oh, you apologies, for... apologies, there is a direct response. e tray one first. <laughs> I will come to you after that. So e tray one first. Um, I want to disagree with uh, the, my fellow delegate who just spoke. I think OC11 proposes a very sufficient solution since the testing will not only uh, will, uh, will allow uh, us to see how effective the measures are. Is the literacy increasing from its starting point? How is it developing? and are developments in different member states pacing at a different rate, so do measures need to be changed for different member states, so that's why I think uh, Clause 11 is very much needed in this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, and now Gerard Tu, go ahead. Thank you for recognizing. I have concern on 9th OC. If a person has a health problem and he or she can live till the pension, what happens with the money which person earns during the lifetime? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now take the final point in this round, and it will go to e 2. Thank you for recognizing me. First of all, I want to congratulate you to this resolution. However, I cannot seem to find um, OCs tackling uh, the issues on robo-advice that you were mentioning in the ICs L and M. If you could may direct me to these OCs, thank you. Thank you, Val. We'll now go back to Econ 1 for their response to that round. Econ 1, are you ready to respond? Excellent, you're recognized. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, all committees for their constructive criticism, and I'm sure that by incorporating your feedback, we can make this resolution a common one. When it comes to the first question that Econ 3 had, um, the aim of this OC is not to make investment more sustainable, but the aim is to inform people whether their investment is sustainable. Then you also had a question on whether uh, it would be unbiased, whether it could be unbiased, and we think that by letting the European Commission control and hand out these uh, ESG scales, uh, there's no doubt that they will be unbiased. Then the second question was from Ample, and uh, I would just like to remind, rem remind all of you that our topic is not really about pensions, it's about how to um, raise, how to increase financial literacy among young Europeans. Then the third question was about the financial literacy date. Uh, so we want a financial literacy day not only um, as a reference date, but also to raise awareness on the topic of financial literacy. 
In many European countries, financial literacy is not looked upon as an important topic, and by having a, a, an international or a European Financial Literacy Day, we want to raise awareness on financial literacy and its importance. Then there was uh, a question on when uh, and on what age we want a, a, a financial literacy test. And we find that a financial literacy, literacy test should be conducted both in preliminary school and in high school. This financial literacy test is very important in improving um, financial literacy and in uh, keeping track of the improvements of financial literacy across the EU. That is why we need this test, that's why it's necessary, because we can only uh, improve financial literacy if, if we can keep track of, our, uh, of the improvements. Then um, there was a question on people who don't work, what happens with them? Uh, first of all, that's a, a first pillar pension problem, and that's not, really our, um, that's not really what we look at. We are looking at, as I said, the financial, how to increase financial literacy among young Europeans. And you, but your example does emphasize the need to invest, the need to uh, invest in the third pension pillar, because people who invest in the third pension pillar more than they do now will uh, be able to cope with issues like not being able to work, because their investment will uh, make sure they have a pension and they won't rely on the first pillar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. We'll now take a last, slightly shorter round of points still. And just as a reminder for the proposing committee as well that you'll still be responding to the points from this final round from the floor. Um, so we, we will start with a point from Libe. Thank you for recognizing us. Uh, addressing your attention to clause 14b, considering the fact that uh, the education systems across the member states are nor, neither identical nor un uniform, this clause interferes with their school curriculum profoundly, which in turn may make, it no, may make this clause not feasible. In fact, inserting financial literacy as part of other subjects would ensure a smoother transition of financial literacy into the school curriculum, and I think it's a better option. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Econ 2, and after that, we'll take a point from AFET. So Econ 2 first. Thank you for finally recognizing us. Uh, my question is um, regarding the OC number 9, the com the, about harmonizing tax incentives. The commission is not harmonizing tax in, uh, treatment of personal pension product because the tax uh, taxation is dependent on the domicile of the PAP saver. So my question is, uh, why do you want to harmonize tax incentives? And if so, tax uh, harmonization is uh, basically br bringing more efficient uh, allocation of resources within an integrated market. So how will you allocate, how are you planning to allocate these resources more effectively? Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I see we have a direct response from Libe, so we'll go there first. Thank you for the point, Econ 2. I want to add up that, moreover, the national treatment principle guarantees that the PEP saver paving, uh, paying contributions to that national compartment gets the same tax treatment as when he paid contributions to the comparable national personal pension product. Thank you. Thank you. And now for the final point in this final round. We'll go to AFED, as promised. Um, thank you very much. Now, OCs 1, 2, and 3 are focused on creating a wide range of learning platforms. However, uh, using online adverti advertisement will not assure the success of this project. And therefore, I would like to know what is Econ's approach uh, to actually sparking interest about financial issues among the youth. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Econ 1, we'll go back to you for a response to the final round, again from the floor. Econ 1, are you ready? Great, you're recognized. Um, thank you so much to all the committees for your constructive criticism and question raised in this final um, round of debate. Um, I want to start with a question from Liebe on um, Clause 14b. Um, we want to use financial literacy in the school curriculums because it's such an important topic and as I can assure you, a lot of people in here don't have the financial knowledge um, required to um, have safe and 
so adequate um, savings in the future for their pensions. That's why we need financial literacy in school cur curriculums so badly. Then on Econ 2, Econ mm, 2, on OC 9, um, we need um, tax harmonization to implement this this um, PEP product because it's the same all over, we need it to be the same all over Europe. And that's true, we can't force the member states, but we can strongly encourage them and urge them to make a tax harmonization um, for it to work better and work more smoothly to ensure that the PEP is used how it should be and that it has the results need, um, which are so badly needed. Um, then Afed raised the point on subclauses uh, one, two, and three, and um, how we can spark interest in young people. That is an extremely difficult um, subject, and we can't force anyone to like a subject that is um, admittedly very dry, but we can um, still, through, um, for example, how we said the video games, for example, are a very good um, example how to make financial literacy or financial education more, um, more sexy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. I'll now give the um, proposing committee one minute to think about whether they would like to amend their resolution or not. Um, in the meantime, I would invite other committees to reflect on this very active debate we've had. So yes, Econ 1, you have one minute. Okay, thank you very much. I now have the amendment that has been submitted by the Econ Committee, um, Econ 1 Committee. It is amending clause 14, so, um, subsection B, which will now read, introducing financial literacy content into existing subjects such as mathematics at all levels of education and vocational training. I'll read that out again. So, so 14B now reads, Introducing financial literacy content into existing subjects such as mathematics at all levels of education and vocational training.
Thank you very much. I would now like to invite a member of the proposing committee to come up to the podium to deliver the summation speech. Yes, Econ 1, you're recognized. Honorable board, respected guests, and fellow delegates. My name is Milica, and I'm here on the behalf of Econ 1 committee. Now, before I start, I would like to ask you two questions. Raise your hand if you have started investing in retirement funds. Now, raise your hand if you have ever taken a picture with the face filter app that makes you look several decades older, or at least saw someone's picture using that filter. Most people would rather go to the dentist than listen to lectures about financial education. However, I would not agree that young people do not care about their retirement. I say that we care about our future and much more than previous generations. The current pension system was developed for a labor market which no longer exists. Previous generations grew up in a time where it was common to work for the same company in the same country during the entire work life. That meant that they could rely on a steady, secure pension provided by the mandatory first two pillars. No incentive, therefore, for investing in the third voluntary pillar really existed. Well, times have changed. Our generation is more mobile and flexible than ever. Many of us here will spend our work life working for different employers in different member states. As people are living uh, longer, pensions need to be provided for a longer period of time, but a decrease in birth rates means that less and less people are contributing to the state-provided pension system. Demographic change has led to the pressure on the pension system growing. The burden on us, the young generation, is alarmingly growing. Therefore, it is essential to take the matters into our own hands. It is essential to understand the importance of investing in third pillar funds, such as the PEP. Yes, there is a risk associated with the PEP, as there is with any investment. But there is a greater risk of choosing not to invest. By relying on just the first two pillars, you are choosing not to have power over your own financial security. And financial security is something that everyone has the right to have, regardless of age, nationality, and background. Obtaining financial literacy is like learning a language. The earlier you start, the better. So let's make it a language that everyone has the access to. Let's make it the language we all understand and speak in Europe. Yes, our pensions might be a long way from today, but decisions we make today are the decisions that decide upon our financial security in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Milita. We will now move on to the vote on the resolution as amended. So take a minute to think about your vote, still update your chairperson on how you are voting, but we will then also take a show of hands to indicate to the whole of the GA how, how you're voting. So take a minute to update your chair on your vote, please. And if I can also just ask chairs to raise their placards once you have counted the votes.
Great, thank you everyone. Now, we will take a vote by show of hands and while we're doing that, can the chairpersons please um, submit them onto the statistics as well. So I would like to ask all those in favor of the resolution, please raise your hand. And those against? And any abstentions? I think that was too close for me to be able to call from here, so we will have to verify it off the statistics. So if all chairs can please make sure to submit your um, voting figures onto the GA statistics and we'll check on there what the final number of votes are. Thank you. Okay, so the situation we have at the moment is that the vote is a tie, 101 in favor, 101 against. We do, we do have six abstentions, so what I would like to do is I would like to ask whether those who abstained would like to take a stance. If not, if not, then the result of the vote will be up to the chair's discretion. Board's discretion, apologies. For, like, I was for, for this resolution, I even prepared a tax speech for
If the chairs still have changes to the votes, can I ask you to raise your placard? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank those of you who took the time to still think about this and, and take a stance. So I'm pleased to announce that the resolution has passed with 106 <laughs> votes in favor and 103 against. Congratulations, Econ, and thank you very much for, for deciding to take a stance on these issues. It's always great to see as many people vote as possible and take a stand, so thank you very much. And thank you also for a really lively debate. Good morning from my side as well. Um, I would like just to mention very briefly on uh, the previous debate that as you can see, it's quite clear from the voting procedure that if you don't take a stance because um, you're absent, it's okay because you're not in the building. But if you're abstaining, it can be a very much of a great difference to the whole debate and the resolution itself. So if I would kindly ask you to do pay attention because is it as much possible to just respect the work of our fellow delegates and uh, then have a say in uh, every resolution that's kind of come through. So without further ado, we're moving on to the motion for a resolution by the Committee on Human Rights 1. The topic reads as follows. Breaking the Dublin deadlock. While talks between member states on reforming the Dublin system remain deadlocked, the European Court of Justice has ruled that poor living conditions should not be grounds to prevent the relocation of refugees. How should the EU respond to continued calls for, for reform of an asylum system, given the human rights concerns arising from the current policy? Do we have a member of the proposing committee to hold your proposition speech? Yes, draw one, you are recognized. Honorable members of the board, distinguished guests, fellow delegates. In 2015, we faced the so-called refugee crisis, but more importantly, since then, we have faced a solidarity crisis. The EU institutions and the member states simply failed at finding an efficient common solution. The common European asylum system tried to provide sustainable help to people fleeing persecution or serious harm in their own country, the people in need of international protection. Unfortunately, this basic human right recognized in the Geneva Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights is currently not properly guaranteed. While the EU member states originally share the same values and should support each other in that matter, we have noticed that basic human rights, such as the access to healthcare, education, or housing, have not been guaranteed properly. Furthermore, the application procedures for asylum seekers have neither been fair nor adequate because indeed legal gaps occur and countries of interest are overburdened. Continuously calls for reforms, given these concerns I just addressed, are arising 
and those we intend and I believe addressed in our resolution. We are aware that our topic is controversial and emotional, which is why we're focusing on the legal obligations that we have. Especially in the light of the ongoing negotiations to reform the regulation, we are proposing to tackle the immediate human rights concerns, the lacking international cooperation among member states, and the long-term implementation of reforms toward the respect of human rights, enhance asylum-seeking procedures, improve distribution and psychological support. To finish, I'd like to cite Jean-Claude Juncker, stating that the starting point for the future of the European migration policy are the common European values and historic responsibility. As he said, Europe will need more solidarity to prepare for the future, the future of a prosperous continent that will always be open for those in need, but that will also deal with the challenge of migration together and not leave some to cope alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray, um, for this proposition speech. Uh, I will now open the floor for any position speeches. Shh. We're going to have one from ITRE1, followed by IMCO. delegates, honorable board members, and dear guests. I will start by congratulating the committee of Draw One for this very competent resolution, which covers all aspects of the asylum system. It provides solution for socioeconomic problems, such as the healthcare, education, and shelter of asylum seekers seen in operative clauses four and five. It further draws attention to important legislation, such as the European Convention on Human Rights and uh, Geneva Refugee Convention and Protocol, as well as the actions of important commissions like the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, put in Clause uh, 8 as an example to member states. However, I believe that there are certain proposals in the resolution which would benefit from more details and specifics. For example, you mentioned overburdened countries and how member states should show their solidarity for these countries. But I think that, these con that all member states would say that they have accepted their fair share of asylum seekers, and perhaps having a common definition or maybe certain criteria to fulfill uh, in order to be classified as overburdened would help um, clarify the situation more. Furthermore, um, you mentioned providing um, psychological support for asylum seekers, which is um, very important uh, in terms of um, refugees feeling welcomed in the countries they go to, but you fail to clarify where the support will come from, whether it's from the state, or if so, will all member states have the power to provide this financial support, even though it is so important? If not, I would suggest the setting up of a volunteering group or perhaps researching into funds from organizations which are willing to help. Um, to conclude, this resolution is very promising and hopes to provide solutions for a situation which is of vital importance to the EU at the moment. Therefore, I urge all delegates to vote in favor and the proposing committee to take into account the constructive feedback given. Thank you. Dear President, honorable members of the board, my dear fellow delegates, as a delegate of IMCO committee, I would like to deliver this speech against the resolution of the Committee on Human Rights One. To begin with, ICC is a confusing clause. What the resolution mentions as an act worth appreciating is that although many apl applications are submitted, only some of the latter are examined. This is not an act that ought to be appreciated. Also, OC1 requires a slight clarification of your chosen actor. As mentioned, also as mentioned in OC9, the resolution invites the signatories of the Dublin III regulation to reform the asylum procedures while Dublin IV is still under negotiation. 
The committee's resolution offers opening new negotiations when Dublin 4 is still under negotiation and thus it is unclear what proposals Dublin 4 has exactly. Also regarding OC 13, while this could be a potential solution for some refugees with access to such online platforms, most asylum seekers leave their home country due to extremely bad living conditions. Also considering that the numbers of asylum seekers are very high, the system would be very crowded and thus lead to misuse again, thus not solving the problem. The same existing problems with the asylum application examination procedures would continue, so how is that a solution? Also regarding OC12, an extension of a deadline is a serious action and should be specified as such. Thus, the resolution should specify the extension required. For the above mentioned reasons, I would ask for the delegates to vote against the resolution or take into consideration our uh, suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Handy and Aya, for your position speeches. Uh, now we will go back to draw one. Yes, you're recognized to answer these um, two position speeches. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you for the comments and the feedback. Uh, I do want to start with addressing that it is, uh, or to stress that it is our topic to reform the Dublin so we can't really do anything about those concerns. Um, I would also like to, um, yeah, put the focus on the fact that we're focusing on the human rights concerns uh, while addressing, uh, yeah, while addressing OC9, we don't want to open new negotiations. We specified this in our resolution, um, and we're giving proposals on directions that the negotiations should take. Um, yeah. Uh, and when it comes to psych psychological aspect of it, we have specified that in OC6, the um, member state, the offer psychology help, and the group therapy part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayun, for these clarifications. And moving on uh, to the first round of debate. We're going to have a point from ITRE2. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, regarding OC3, mentioning the proposal to ratify legal documents through the home countries of potential asylum seekers, I urge you to consider the fact that the home countries of the asylum seekers will never cooperate with the EU member states to support getting rid of their own citizens that potentially have the capacity to ameliorate the circumstances in their home country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Okay, draw one, you have a direct response. Uh, you literally just quoted our OC. The OC states that the um, refugees or the asylum seekers should not be required to uh, ratify their documents in their uh, respective home countries' um, uh, embassies, but rather that uh, the member state which receives them should um, look into other ways to verify who they are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Econ 3, are you sure that your direct response refers to Joel One's response and not to the point previously made? Yes, then you're recognized. So as the alleviation of the ratification process might leave space for a potential misuse or even abuse of the system, how will you address the risk of false identities and similar crimes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will take a point from NV1. In OC10, you stated that refugees' preferences should be taken into account. However, what's going to happen if some countries get overburdened with requests? For example, what happened in Hungary in 2015? Thank you very much. And then we will move on with... Okay, direct response. I can still see. From uh, uh, the Committee on Employment. Uh, thank you for your recognition. I would also like to add uh, to the point previously made. 
uh, that this step would not only directly increase the number of people coming into EU because now they could basically choose the countries where they want to live, but also bring another unnecessary step into the already overwhelmed system which you have already acknowledged. That's why I believe this subclause should be extracted from your resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, now we'll take a point from NV2. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Uh, I'm from the NV2 committee, Mihaela, uh, and I feel like in your uh, resolution, you, the OCs 3 and 12 are a bit contradictory. Uh, if you wish to alleviate any requirements to ratify legal documents, wouldn't it be impossible to get rejected? Thank you. If you feel like I, uh, I've misunderstood your points, please do clarify it a bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihaela. Now we will take the following point from INTA, followed by ITRE 3. INTA, you're recognized. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you for the recognition. I would like to point out a relatively substantial problem that has not been touched upon in the resolution. Well, essentially, there is a legislative gap between data protection rules of European citizens and asylum seekers, in the sense that the conditions under which the personal data of asylum seekers is accessed by various third parties are rather vague, and GDPR doesn't cover this aspect at all. Therefore, I would like to hear committee's stance on the topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. If we could close our mic. Great. Uh, now, as promised, we will go to ITRE 3, followed by IMCO. Uh, thank you for recognizing us. We have a question regarding your 8th OC, subclause B. Uh, so how do you suggest the sovereignty of member states will not be violated, since there is no way for NGOs to ensure safe transport, while, uh, nor do they have the competence to do so? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to IMCO and then back to the proposing committee to answer this round of debate. So, IMCO. I would like to draw attention to OC number two, where um, you talk about uh, volunteering for member states, but they have no incentive, making this OC uh, somewhat redundant. I would improve it by uh, incentivize and uh, motivate the member states to volunteer, because it's a good OC. Thank you very much for this point. Econ 1, yes, your direct response is recognized. Um, so about OC number two and encouraging member states to take in refugees. I think even improving the the encouraging process for, for countries such as Poland, for example, when the majority of people don't want to take refugees and they're strongly against it, that wouldn't work even in that case. So I'd, I would suggest so to somehow help member states such as Poland that are against refugees to seek for maybe some jobs for refugees. So that will make taking in refugees profitable for that country. Thank you. Okay, Itre, yes, um, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, also regarding OC number two, how will you actually ensure that um, the other states will be solidar with the ones who are, which are overburdened by countries, uh, by um, refugees? See, seeing that, uh, more and more countries from the Schengen area are closing their borders and in introducing internal borders so as to prevent 
uh, the influx of refugees to come in their countries, how will you actually ensure that they are solidarity to one another and prevent everything? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. Okay. I will recognize again the last direct response for this round of debate, and then we're going back to the proposing committee. Thank you. Afet, you recognized. Thank you. I completely agree with the point previously made because why would countries do something voluntarily in your OC4 if they haven't done it by now? How are you going to enforce that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joao-Wan, you have uh, plenty of questions to answer for this round. Yes, you're recognized. Okay, um, regarding the first question, uh, interviews with uh, asylum seekers are already in place to um, uh, make sure that they will not be harmful to society and to the countries they're integrating. Um, uh, regarding OC number 10, um, 10B uh, specifically, um, this, uh, this subclause only, would only take into account their preferences rather than make them choose. So their preferences would be taken into account in where they want to transfer, but that does not necessarily mean they would transfer to that country. And 10C uh, establishes a mandatory corrective allocation mechanism, which means that countries with too many asylum seekers, refugees, would um, relocate uh, the, those refugees to other countries without as many refugees. Um, uh, regarding the OC about legal documents, um, we are talking about legal documents specifically in the embassies of the, of the countries from which the refugees are coming from, not about giving their documents to the countries in which they are uh, becoming refugees. So I hope that clears up any um, mess. Uh, regarding the GDPR, we are very uh, glad that you have pointed this out and we might make an amendment uh, regarding the GDPR later on. Um, regarding OC number eight, we are just endorsing the efforts of the NGOs who are already doing this. So we, we cannot um, oversee the efforts of the NGOs because they are non-governmental, they have no um, the, the, the EU has no competency regarding them, so we're just saying that what they're doing is great and we love it. Um, and regarding OC number two, uh, the EU is not a country. We cannot tell our member states what to do. We can just ask them very, very nicely. And uh, that goes for OC4 as well. We cannot force them to do what we want. We can just tell them to please, please do this, and if you don't, you're a bad person. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for these very nice clarifications when it came to questions from round one. Because now we're going to round two of this open debate, and we will take a point from Drua two, followed by Econ one. Thank you for the recognition. Uh, on behalf, my name is Vadim, and on behalf of our committee, we'd like to draw the attention of Drua one back to clause uh, 10C, just because there's been a case with the Visegrad countries, who are Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, who refused and were strongly opposing any proposal coming from the team of Jean-Claude Juncker in 2016. And here comes the question. If even a voluntary consent of each member state, a voluntary principle did not work out at that time, would it work now? Uh, especially it wouldn't. Then what compulsory measures could you propose except for paying, uh, let's say, uh, fines for not accepting refugees on a relocation principle? Thank you very much, my dame. Um, and as promised, yes, we're going to Econ 1. Yes, thanks for recognizing me, and thank you to the proposing committee for a very well-developed resolution in total. Um, I would like to ask for clarification to what is to be achieved with your OC number three, because if it means that you do not want to expose asylum seekers um, to the regimes they, came, they were coming from uh, threatening them, I think it would be a really good thing. But the way it is phrased now, saying alleviate any requirement um, to provide legal documents, I see a threat that people generally will not have to prove their origin 
at all any longer, and that would be not good in my opinion. So if you could uh, once more say your intent with OC number three, thank you. Thank you very much, Pjarne. And moving on to employment followed by Libe. Okay, so on OC4, with the migrant camp humanitarian crises in the richer member states like France, how can the less stable and poorer economies, for example Greece, who in fact get more refugees, manage to provide all the full list of OC4 provisions, let alone the basic ones? Thank you very much, uh, Punim, and we're going to Libe. Good morning, thank you for the floor. Um, well, in your resolution, you talk about solutions for refugee allocation, but I see that there are not solutions for management of applications. So, asylum offices in charge of applications, asylum applications are super saturated in some countries. For example, in June of 2019, 100,000 asylum applications were accumulated in the asylum office in Spain. So, there are other countries that there aren't that much applications, so it's not really equal. So then, what about creating an European platform that manages all the applications, or have you thought about another solution? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mireya. And now we will go to Econ2. Uh, hi, my name is Georgia from Econ2, and I would like to draw the attention how uh, basically the policies uh, do not want to improve or completely change the original Dublin criteria, which created many problems and basically chaos in Europe, and instead just adds additional, uh, basically, uh, basically like an amendment to it, just just extending the the things that EU does and it also incentivizes even more people to come, effectively making uh, EU some sort of nanny state to people from the third world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgi. And now we will take a point from... ITRE2, and then we go back to the proposing committee to answer this round of debate. So, ITRE2. Thank you for recognizing me. I have a question regarding OC4. Uh, um, I think that you've missed the biggest point about this OC. Uh, uh, OC. I believe that providing refugees with a tempor temporary um, ident identification card isn't tackling the fact that most refugees have to wait for years to even get an answer regarding um, uh, their residence applications. Uh, I would appreciate an explanation for this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that was quite fast. So, NV2, uh, your direct response is recognized. So, uh, I have kind of a similar question. I just want to add to it that not only it's about refugees, it's about only in the member states, that uh, this temporary ID uh, will, how will it actually help to res for the member states to prevent, uh, you know, not to prevent, to actually follow the human rights the correct way? And will this make the citizens of the countries and the specific parties angrier? Because we already have specific problems, especially in Greece, we have a, a big problem with refugees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irini. Uh, and now back to the proposing committee to answer this round of debate. Yes, Drew one you're recognized. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll try to address um, all the points uh, that were made and maybe clear things up a bit. Um, so maybe I'll start with um, the question regarding Pol uh, countries like Poland or Slovakia or Hungary that are not very willing to accept refugees. The thing and the question about measures. The thing is measures already exist um, and it's not really our task for like the first thing because um, and we can't really enforce it. So that's for the 10th OC. Uh, thank you very much for the platform suggestion. We appreciate it a lot. But at the same time, I would like to point that it, we already have it in our OCs. That's OC number 13. And I believe that it tackles uh, the problem you, like you told about. Um, regarding OC number four, 
And the thing is, this OC is about asylum seekers, not refugees. And that's a big difference because we wa only want to ensure that asylum seekers have rights to actually um, have, you know, good life uh, wh while waiting. Because refugees, there are already many measures regarding refugees, but there are no for asylum seekers. So that's a difference, and we would like to, you to understand it. Um, also, um, I would like to point out that it's not only about our ethics and human rights, but also that international law just tells very directly to this, its signatures that um, countries should actually accept refugees. And so that's the thing with all the questions about human rights. Of course, we can't ensure and make every country in Europe um, accept all refugees and follow human rights directions. Of course, like we can't possibly do that. But there's law for it, and we're all people. And we believe that even if ethics is not enough, the law is enough, because we're countries, we're European Union, and yeah, so <laughs> that's the case. Um, um, thank you very much, yeah, uh, Tosia. We'll come back to you in the next round of answering the debate as well. Since this is going to be also the final round of debate for uh, draw one, so I would like to see as many as the placards up in the air as possible. Okay, we will take a point from IMCO followed by Econ One. Um, so, regarding OC4 and OC12, can you comment on, on those as these legislations will put a lot of burden on the member states challenge with the considerable number of asylum seekers, meaning that they might become even more Eurosceptic and pessimistic towards the problem in question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to Econ 1. My question is regarding the second OC. Uh, I want to ask, do you have a specific way of encouragement member states? Because uh, in case of this kindly asking, they, they, like member states have been asked for four years already. And from my personal perspective, maybe there is, uh, like, in, uh, since you're in charge of reforming the asylum system, maybe there is a way to introduce some kind of insensitive system. So. Actually, member states will be uh, so member states will, uh, this will be the personal advantage to take as many asylum seekers as they want and to uh, operate their forms of uh, asking for, for asylum. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Libe, we're going to have your direct response. Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for recognizing. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, responding to my uh, previously colleagues mentioned point and to all the related points, uh, we don't need an incentivization system, if that's a word, because and and there is also not the thing that we cannot make them comply. We can because EU, sorry, not EU, European Commission can put on quotas, not even can. In 2015, all the member states were given uh, refugee quotas. Most of them have met them, but countries like Poland, like Hungary, have not, and they're proud of it. That's a systematic problem, and you can imply very strict regulations on how many refugees they, can, they have to take, and if they don't, you can make them comply by I don't know what, like sanctions or whatever, whatever, but yes, you can and stop saying you cannot because you can, it has already been done, but it's not working. So how can you solve that? Thank you very much, um, Libe, for that direct response. And now we will take a point from, if you wave the placards, I cannot see them, sorry. Inta followed by Itre one. Uh, thank you. I'm Katerina from the Italian delegation. My question is about clause 8b on ensuring safe transport for the asylum seekers to their home countries. Um, I wanted to ask how this would happen given the fact that there are problems on both sides 
uh, in the sense of the departure of the asylum seekers, but also from the arrivals. For example, Italy is one of the many countries that refuses to have ships ar with immigrants arrive in the havens. And how is that going to be solved? Because that's not a safe transport. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. And now we're going to Itre one, as promised. Thank you for recognition. First, I would like to congratulate Ro for a really constructive resolution, but still I would like to have some clarification about the OC number five. Um, I would like to ask about ambassador program and that mobility that they would possibly have. Does that mean that uh, this ambassador program and meetings would be situated in one location, one country, let's say, or it will frequently move? And if yes, how would you then solve the issue with the temporary ID card? Because not every single document is valid for another or different country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll take the final point uh, for this debate for Joao One. And this will come from Econ3. I'm um, thankful for the recognition. So uh, my point refers to the OC 10, point B. Since the EU faces a considerable number of issues related to the allocation of the asylum seekers and refugees, taking into account the preferences regarding the country of relocation will complicate the process of relocation and will be burdensome for the EU. The EU can propose the country and it's up to the asylum seekers to accept the proposal or not. Consequently, I propose you to delete the point B in the OC10. Thank you. Thank you very much for this point. Now going back to the proposing committee to answer this round of debate, the final round of debate. Yes, you're recognized. So thank you for your, um, well, constructive critique. Um, firstly, regarding the questions to OC4 and 12, well, we are already moving refugees from overburdened countries to alleviate, su alleviate such stress on the population or the government of those countries. Um, regarding um, the question about OC2 and its direct response, I mean, we would like to sanction them. We would really like to give them some strong incentives, but unfortunately, they can just veto that if the states for example, Poland or Hungary, that aren't as cooperative, just protect each other with their veto rights. Um, regarding 8B, we are only supporting NGOs that already do that. We don't actually have to set up the whole system as it is stated in 8B. Um, regarding OC5, uh, I think there was a slight misunderstanding. It is the, the ambassadors are supposed to be set up in every refugee camp, every country, just to talk with the local authorities on a daily or maybe weekly and definitely direct basis. And um, ten, for 10, we are only taking their suggestions where they would want to live into a court, but that does not mean that they become the determining factor in the reallocation pro process. We will just consider them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gregor, for these clarifications. And this um, summarizes uh, the end of the open debate. I would now call for a member of the proposing committee if you want to hold your summation speech. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, you have uh, some minutes to decide on the amendment. While the rest of you uh, just think about uh, the points made in this debate and your stance on the issue um, and how you feel about the future of Europe concerning the refugees.
Thank you very much, uh, draw one for the amendment, and I would kindly ask you all to go to operative clause number four. There is an addition there. The clause reads as follows, invites member states to ensure the respect for human rights, such as, but not limited to, the right to healthcare, education, and shelter. And here we have an addition, which reads as follows, as well as privacy rights according to GDPR. And then the clause continues, for all asylum seekers, as well as foster care for minors, whilst their applications for refugee status is being processed. So the addition is right after the shelter, as well as privacy rights according to GDPR. Can I have a member of the proposing committee to hold your summation speech? Yes, draw one, you're recognized. Dear President, honorable members of the board, and dear delegates. Um, first of all, we want, to announce, we want to announce that we made the amendment to address the GDPR concerns. I'm happy to be here with you all, to be able to speak up for those refugees who I met them during um, my volunteering journey in the refugees camp and also my own journey years ago. Years ago, sorry. I'm here to ask you all to help those people who came to Europe bringing with them their hope, dreams, ambitions. Refugee, refugees are just like us. They want to leave a good mark in the world, in Europe, and in the countries when the war ends, and they be able to get back and just rebuild their countries. They really want to change things to the better, like all of us here. They, and let's all help them to achieve that. Many refugees lost their dreams and hope because of the poor living conditions in the refugees camp. Also because of the lack of psychological health. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Also because of the la um, psychological health care not only for refugees, but also for asylum seekers. Those, and even those who couldn't arrive to Europe because of the unsafe roads. Let's work all together to change their conditions, take care of their education, mental health, listen to them, so we can learn from them what they know, and also and let, them, let them to teach us what they know, and what they learned from the hard journeys. Let's support their goals for the better world, the better Europe we want to make all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina, for uh, summing up uh, your debate and everything that was said uh, on the topic. I would kindly ask you now to have a few moments to think of what you're voting for. Tell that vote to your respective chairperson so he or she can submit it, and then we will continue with a show of hands.
Okay. Could I please have everyone sit it down? And as the procedure is, and up until all the chairs have submitted their votes, I would uh, ask you to raise your hand if you're in favor for this motion for a resolution. Thank you. Raise your hands now, all those of you who are against. Thank you very much. Those of you who are abstaining. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was quite clear from the show of hands, but we had to verify as well that the motion for resolution in the Committee on Human Rights won has passed. <laughs> so congratulations on that. And just before we go to lunch, and you can celebrate uh, how, how much as you want to, uh, there are a few announcements to be made. Um, so first of all, uh, just to make clear, you're not allowed to leave the GA venue or the premises throughout the GA. The, the only time that you're actually allowed to go is when coffee break, when lunch, or when you have a toilet emergency. You're not allowed to just go to the coffee break area when we're having debates because this is not the procedure and this is not a hanging out area, but rather just for a coffee break when the time is assigned. I hope that's clear enough. Uh, second announcement is just before you leave, pack clean up your stuff because we will reallocate the committees in the GA venue. So just pack them, leave them on the side so when you come back, we don't lose time in not now, not just now. <coughs> Yes, just pack them as soon as I'm done talking. Uh, uh, because we want to be quick with uh, reallocations and you don't have to do it then. And third, lunch is from one to two and in which I would kindly ask you to be here five to two so that we can start on time. Oh, also, just when you come back from lunch, can you please gather in committees be, uh, behind the door, please? Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.